Greetings, and welcome to Mavanwini's studio here in Leitrim's Iron Mountains. My name is Harriet, and today I will be sharing another one of my watercolor mermaid paintings in my sketchbook. Yes, a mermaid painting, because I am taking part in Mermaid. This is my first year taking part in Mermaid, and I am following the prompt list by fellow YouTuber Erica Joy, and I will leave a link to her channel below the video, where she is creating some amazing mermaid paintings this mermaid. I will also leave a link to her inspirational prompts list if you would like to join in for the rest of the month of May. We are a week into mermaid, and this footage is from day seven, and the prompt is seaweed. I had a vision of this piece with the mermaid hiding amongst the seaweed. I wanted her to be camouflaged, so I wanted to keep the colors quite minimal. I started this piece by sketching out the composition with mechanical pencil. I wanted the sketch to be quite minimal because I knew that this piece I wanted to wash in a lot of background color because I wanted to create the illusion of a depth of seaweed with layers of wash. I felt if I had too much drawing done, I would struggle to be covering up too much pencil line at the end and then it might get too complicated. I wanted to allow these initial washes to dictate the direction of the piece for me. My idea for this piece is to do the mermaid a similar seaweed green to the greens I was going to paint the seaweed. I envisioned this mermaid being very tiny and I wanted to make her tail look like seaweed. The type of seaweed that I'm depicting here I think it's called rockweed. There is many different types of seaweed. There is also a type called mermaid's hair which is very fine and string-like. Once I had the sketch done, I started by layering in the colours. I mixed up a few different shades of the seaweed greens, kind of an olive green, and then I started washing out areas of the painting. I washed in a thin layer for the tail. I added some dimension of shading, but not too much. I allowed the paint to be loose and watery and let the water push the pigment into creating some interesting watery qualities with the paint. At times I let the paper get a little bit too wet, which does make it crinkle. It's usually okay once it's dry. I have found if my book of paintings, which is often crinkly, I will just sit on it in the studio when I'm sitting around having my coffee, and that acts as a press and presses the pages flat and usually will remove a lot of the crinkle in the pages. That's a little trick I use to keep the book nice and flat. Once this wash was dry, I spent time methodically outlining the piece with different shades of green and then just gradually building in more definition of line and shading with my paintbrush. Although this piece doesn't have a great diversity of colour, I really like the subtlety of the composition and that you might not see the mermaid's tail straight away when you look at it. I really like how this piece came out, that you have to look for the definition of her tail because it looks so similar to the seaweed that's growing around it. I think this is another favourite of mine. Following on from my last three videos, where I have been narrating The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen, and this is the original text of the story that most people know the Disney version, so I thought it would be fun to narrate the original, which has a different ending to the version that we're all most familiar with. So just a small recap, we are introduced to the mermaid in her home where she lives with her father and her grandmother and her six sisters and she has become completely infatuated by the prince who lives on the land above and she rescues him from a shipwreck and he doesn't know that she exists but she's become completely besotted with him and is kind of stalking him outside his palace but in the most romantic fairy tale way so i will read on until the end of the video. Many a night, when fishermen were out at sea with their blazing torches, she heard them say many good things about the young prince, and it pleased her that she had saved his life when he was drifting half dead on the waves, and she thought how firmly his head had rested on her breast, and how frequently she had kissed him. He knew nothing about it. He couldn't even dream about her. She came to like human beings more and more, and she wished more and more to be able to rise up among them. Their world seemed to her to be much bigger than hers, for they could fly across the ocean on ships, 
climb high mountains above the clouds, and the countries they owned stretched with their forests and fields further than the eye could see. There was so much she wanted to know, but her sisters could not answer everything, so she asked her old grandmother, and she was familiar with the higher world, which is what she rightly called the lands above the sea. When humans do not drown, said the little mermaid, can they stay alive forever? Don't they die like we do down in the sea? Oh yes, the old woman said. They too have to die, and their lives are even shorter than ours. We can live until we are 300 years old, but we cease to exist. We just become foam on the water, not even have a grave down here amongst our dear ones. We do not have an immortal soul, and we never live again. We are like the green rushes. Once they have been severed, they cannot grow green again. Humans, on the other hand, have a soul, and they live forever. Lives even after the body had become earth, it rises up through the clear sky into all the shining stars. Just as we rise to the surface of the sea to see the lands of the humans, they rise up to an unknown lovely place. Those we will never get to see. Why did we never get an immortal soul? The little mermaid asked sadly. I would give up all the 300 years I have just to live as a human being for one day and be part of their heavenly world. You mustn't spend your time thinking about such things, the old woman said. We have a much happier and better life than the humans up there. So am I to die and float like foam on the sea, not to hear the music of the waves and see the lovely flowers in the red sun? Is there nothing I can do to gain an eternal soul? No, the old woman said. Only if a human were to fall in love with you and you were more to him than his father and mother and all his thoughts of love were centred on you, and he would have the priest place his hand on yours and promise to be faithful now, and all in eternity. Only then would his soul flow over your body and you would partake in human happiness. He would give you a soul, and yet retain his own. But that can never happen. For what is so lovely here in the ocean, your fish's tail, they find ugly up there on the earth. They do not understand it at all. Their one has to have two clumsy props, and they call them legs, in order to be considered beautiful or handsome. Then the little mermaid sighed and looked sadly at her fish's tail. Let's be content, the old woman said. Let's jump and leap 300 years we have to live. That's quite a long time after all. And then one can be even more contently in rest in one's grave. This evening, there is to be a court ball. It was more magnificent than anything ever seen on earth. The walls and ceiling of the great dance hall were thick but clear glass. Several hundred huge mussel shells, rosy red and green grass, stood in rows on either side, with blue burning fire that lit up the entire hall and gleamed out through the walls, so that the sea right outside looked quite illuminated. One could see all the innumerable fish, great and small, that swam toward the glass wall. On some of them, scales gleamed a purple red. On others, they seemed to be silvery and gold. A broad running stream ran through the middle of the hall, and on it, mermen and mermaids danced to their own delight, singing. The humans on earth do not have such beautiful voices. The little mermaids sang the most beautiful of them all, and they all applauded her. For a moment, she felt happy in her heart, but she knew she had the loveliest voice of anyone on earth and in the sea. But soon she began to think once more about the world above her. She couldn't forget the handsome prince and her sorrow at not owning, as he did, an immortal soul. So she slipped away from her father's palace, and while everything was singing and all the enjoyment inside, she sat outside in her own little garden and was sad. Then she heard French horns sounding down through the water, and she thought, now he is out sailing. For the one I love even more than my father and mother, the one who fills my thoughts and whose hand I wish to place in my life's happiness, I will risk everything to win him and an immortal soul. While my sisters are dancing inside my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch. I have always been so afraid of her that she can perhaps advise and help me. Now the little mermaid, she left her garden and went towards the roaring whirlpools behind which the witch lived. She'd never gone that way before. No flowers grew there, no seagrass, only the bare grey sandy bottom that stretched towards the whirlpools. Where the water, like roaring mill wheels, whirled round and tore everything they caught down into the depths. 
She had to pass between these crushing, whirling masses of water to get to the region of the Sea Witch. And here, there was for quite some distance no other way other than the hot, bubbling mud the witch called her peat bog. Behind it lay her house. In the middle of a strange forest, all the trees and shrubs were polyps, half animal, half plant. They looked like snakes with hundreds of heads growing out of the earth. All the branches were long, slimy arms with fingers, like pliant worms, and joint by joint they moved from their root to the outermost tip. Everything in the sea that they could catch hold of, they twined round tightly and never let go again. The little mermaid remained standing quite terrified outside there. Her heart pounded with fear. She had almost turned back, and then she fought to the prince and the human soul, and that gave her courage. For she bound her long, fluttering hair around her head so the polyps could not grab it. She folded her hands over her breast and flew as fishes can fly through the water, and amongst the horrible polyps, which stretched out with their pliant arms and fingers after her. She saw that whenever they had seized something, hundreds of small arms held it as if with bands of steel. Humans who had perished in the sea had sunk down to the depths, peeped out from the polyps' arms as white skeletons. They held onto ships' rudders and chests, skeletons of land animals, and a little mermaid that they had caught and strangled. That was what seemed to her to be the most dreadful. He now came to a large slimy place in the forest where large fat water snakes tumbled and showed their vile white yellow bellies. In the middle of this clearing, a house had been built of white bones and shipwrecked human beings. There the sea witch sat, allowing a toad to eat from her mouth, just as some humans allow a small canary to eat sugar. The horrible fat water snakes she called her small chickens, and she let them romp around on her large spongy breast. I know what you want, all right, the sea witch said. It's very stupid of you, but you shall have your will even so, for it will bring you great misfortune, my lovely princess. You want to get rid of your fish's tail, so you may have two props instead to go round like the human beings, so that your young prince can fall in love with you and you can have an immortal soul. And just then, the witch cackled so loudly and horribly that the toad and the grass snakes fell to the ground and tossed around there. You come at precisely the right time. The witch said, Tomorrow, when the sun rises, I could have helped you before another year had passed. I will prepare a drink for you. Before the sun rises, you must swim with it to where the land is and sit down on the shore there and drink it. Then your tail will split and contract into what humans call a nice pair of legs. But it will hurt you. As if a sharp sword had passed through you, everyone who sees you will say you are the loveliest human child they have ever seen. And you will keep your floating walk. No dancer can float as you can. But each step you will take will be like treading on a sharp knife. Make your blood flow. Are you prepared to suffer all this? Well, then I will help you. Yes, Little Mermaid said with a trembling voice and she fought of the prince and winning an immortal soul. But remember this, the witch said. Once you have assumed human form, you can never become a mermaid again. You can never dive through the water to your sisters and to your father's palace. And if you do not gain the love of a prince so that he forgets his father and mother for you, unless you fill his forts and he lets the priest place his hands on each other so that you become man and wife, you will not gain an immortal soul. The first morning after he has married someone else, your heart will break and you will become foam on the water. That is my wish, the little mermaid said, and was deathly pale. But you must also pay me, the witch said, and what I am asking for is no trifle. You have the loveliest voice of all those here on the seabed, and you count embracing him with it, but that voice you must give to me. I must have the best thing that you own for my precious drink. I must give you my own blood for the drink, so that it can be as sharp as a double-edged sword. But if you take my voice, the little mermaid said, what am I left with? Mm, your beautiful appearance, the witch said. Your floating walk and elegant ways, which those who you're sure to be captivate a human's heart. Well, have you lost your 
courage, stretch out your tongue, and I will cut it off as payment, and you shall have your powerful drink. So be it, the little mermaid said, and the witch fetched her cauldron to boil the magical potion. Cleanliness is next to godliness, she said and scoured the inside of it with a grass snake, which she had bound into a knot. Now she made a deep scratch in her breast and let the blood drip down in it. The steam formed queerish shapes that were scaring and frightening. Every second the witch added new things to the cauldron, and when it boiled away, it was as if a crocodile was crying. Finally the drink was ready. It looked like the clearest water. There it is, the witch said, cutting the little mermaid's tongue off. She was mute now, unable to either sing or speak. If the polyp should seize you as you pass through my forest on the way back, the witch said, just throw a single drop of this drink on them, and their arms and fingers will burst into a thousand pieces. But the little mermaid had no need of this. The polyps retreated in fear when they saw she was carrying the gleaming drink that shone in her hand as if it was a twinkling star. So she soon came through the forest, the bog, and the roaring whirlpools. She could see her father's palace, and the lamps had been put out in the large dance hall. They were surely all asleep inside, but she did not dare try to find them, now that she could not speak and would be leaving them forever. It felt as if her heart would break from sorrow. She stole into the garden and took one flower from each of her sister's flower beds, and sent thousands of finger kisses up towards the palace, and rose up through the dark blue waters. That was part four of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. And you'll have to wait till the next video to hear what happens. I'm sorry if I scared anybody with the witch's voice. When I listened to it back, it sounded rather scary. We're coming to the end of my time lapse now. So if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Do stay safe and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Bye bye.